Um, so that brings me, I keep messing that up, to the first speaker, Ed Lattimore. Ed Lattimore is, quite frankly, one hell of a polymath. One part writer, one part heavyweight boxer, one part physicist, one part Twitter phenom. I consistently get my mind expanded by his content every single week. He has a clear and direct communication style that is one of a kind, and I'm so excited for him to grace the stage today. So please welcome to the stage, Ed Lattimore. You don't need that. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I get started, I want to take a moment to thank a few people who, without uh, their support and their encouragement and their direction, this event would not be possible. First and foremost, I want to thank Aaron Watson for organizing the Going Deep Summit. Uh, this entire event uh, is, is his brainchild. Everything you've seen, all the ads on social media, the procurement of the Kelly Strayhorn Theater to host the event, the selection of the speakers, and even the inspiration for some of the topics they will speak on uh, came from Aaron Watson directly. So I want to thank him. Second, I have to thank the Kelly Strayhorn Theater its staff, and all of the sponsors of the Going Deep Summit for making sure this event flows smoothly, punctually. Man, I'm so happy it started on time. I'm a big uh, on-time guy. It was here like 30 minutes early. My girlfriend's like, oh, man, we, do you need to get over to that early? I'm like, yeah, you never know what's going to happen. But I'm really happy that it started on time. And I have to thank them for also making sure the event is well caffeinated. They've got this delicious coffee drink out there. Uh, I drink my coffee black. I don't know if uh, once you add 10 grams of protein to it, it's still considered black, but it is delicious either way, and I think everyone should make sure they get a bottle out there of it. Third, I gotta thank my panel of uh, fellow speakers and presenters today for taking time out of their busy schedules to deliver potent, powerful, and most importantly, valuable advice to us all. And lastly, I got to thank you guys, all the audience, for coming here and braving this uh, not-so-cold January air this morning to be here on a Saturday morning, no less, uh, because without you guys, there would be no Going Deep Summit. So thank you all for coming together and making this thing possible. Now, I don't know the order or I don't know the mindset that Aaron Watson had when he set the order of the speakers. But I do know that by selecting me to be first, he set an impossibly high bar for the other speakers to reach and attempting, <laughs> and in attempting to do so, they're gonna raise the caliber of the event beyond even his wildest expectations. Or, <laughs> what's, what's just as likely, maybe even more so, is that he's getting the worst speaker out of the way first. So that you guys leave on a high note and you go home and you tell all your friends, man, I was at this great conference. You guys missed it. And next year, he sells so many tickets, he's got to move this thing down to the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. No matter what his intentions were, you're in for something special. Because myself and the other speakers up here, we've taken what we've learned the hard way through our specific disciplines, areas of expertise, our professions and our hobbies. And we've broken it down so that you can learn it the easy way. If success is a mountain, everyone wants to know how to get to the top of the mountain. Very few people are interested in how to get down the mountain. This is unfortunate, but it's not surprising. It's not surprising because it's human nature to focus only on the upside of a thing we desire. You know, Fast food and liquor companies don't sell you on hypertension and hangovers. They sell you on the possibility of having your most basic desires instantly gratified. They do this because it's powerful. Most importantly, they do this because it works. It's unfortunate because of a simple law of the universe. What goes up must eventually come down. No matter how high you get 
or how long you're up there, you will eventually have to come back down to earth. Now, if you're fortunate, your descent will be gradual, controlled, and mostly without unpleasantry. But if you're like most people, your tumble down the mountain is gonna be sudden, traumatic, and it's gonna hurt like hell. But it's at that moment, uh, you realize something. Life can simultaneously be the teacher, the lesson, and the test. And when you fail a test, and you will fail a test quite often, you learn more that way than you could have learned any other way that in many ways, it's a win for you. It may not be immediately obvious, but losing and failing and falling off the mountain may be the best thing that ever happened to you. Now, I know this is a, uh, a popular sentiment right now in self-help and self-improvement literature. There are no setbacks, only setups. There are no failures, only lessons. I'm not about to rip a page from your favorite self-improvement book. I've lived this, I know this firsthand. On September 23rd, 2016, I took my own tumble down the mountain of success. But before I tell you about how I got down, I gotta tell you how I got up. I didn't just appear up there, right? I started boxing when I was 23, which is like ancient, man. Uh, I can't even think of an analogy. It would be like deciding you wanna get into weight training when you're, you're 70 or something. And, and yeah, you can do really well, but no one's gonna expect you to compete at a world-class level against guys half your age. It's just unrealistic. And it was unrealistic for me to think that I was going to be able to go far in boxing. But through some good timing and some hard work, I managed to win two national championships as an amateur. And those national championships helped me get the attention of Rock Nation Sports as a promoter when I turned professional. And with that comes enough money, just enough money, to where I don't have to worry about eating. And that's a good thing, because there's not a lot of money in fighting. So I was happy I could eat and go fight. And, and they're, they're building me up and developing me, and I'm beating guys and beating guys. And September 23rd, 2016, is when I was set to make my television debut. On Showtime Sports, prime time, half a million people around the world are going to be watching. It was against the undefeated Trey Lippe Morrison. And for those of you in the know who may know anything about the boxing game, he is the son of the former WBA heavyweight champion, Tommy Morrison. The kid is uh, an experience that only been fighting for three years, but he's tough and he's got incredible punching power. The other thing in my favor though, of those three years he's been boxing, he spent one year nursing his hand, his right punching hand that he had broke. That's how hard he hit. He, he, he punched the guy in the face and he broke his own hand. It's crazy. Uh, so I was like, you know, oh, not just me. I mean, the other guys, the, the people who make these videos online analyzing these things, uh, the fight was expected to be competitive, but I was generally considered the favorite for good reason. I mean, I'm undefeated. He's undefeated, but I've got 10 years of experience. He's got three. So I go and fight, and the fight's in Oklahoma. Miami, spelled like Miami, but you gotta pronounce it Miami, because that's how they pronounce it. <laughs> Miami, Oklahoma, and it's a, it's a hostile environment, because he's from Oklahoma, I'm not. I walk in there and boo, you know, and you, you kind of detach yourself from this moment, you get in there, and you're just like, I'm here to fight, and that's it. And you stay focused, and so I do, I hear this. Judge goes, you got your instructions in the dressing room. Any questions? Any questions? I have no questions. He has no questions. And the fight begins. And I'm out there, and I'm doing pretty well. And I'm, I'm throwing punches, I'm moving, I'm hitting him, take advantage of his, of his inexperience. And then I slip. Actually, who am I kidding? Uh, I didn't realize this until I watched the fight a few months later. I didn't slip, I got demolished by right hand around my guard. I didn't see it coming and it didn't hurt. 
it just disrupted my nervous system to the point where my legs just gave out. I thought it was a slip, though, because I didn't feel anything. So I get up. Ref looks at me. goes, are you okay? They always ask if you're okay. They don't really care. Uh, <laughs> he goes, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm all right. He's like, all right. Wipes my gloves off. Box. I go back out there. And, and I'm, I'm rattled, but I'm aware. I go to fight, and I slip again. <laughs> I ain't really slipped though. This time I did feel this one. I got cracked, dropped, get back up. Breath looks at me, looks in my eye. Now, now you know it, it's fake concern, but but I, I buy it. He looks in my eyes. I think he does something, and then he waves his hands over his head. Fight's over. I just lost in the most embarrassing way possible for a fighter to go a first round knockout. According to the judge's official scorecard, it only took two minutes and 53 seconds for me to fall from the top of the mountain to the bottom. And when you fall that fast, <laughs> not only is it sudden and traumatic, but you can be guaranteed it hurts like no other. And my first thought was, man, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to eat. It took my food money. I didn't really think about other things, but, but I do remember really worrying about that. Um, but as, as time went on, as time went on, I realized something. I learned more losing that way than I would have had I won. Not just lessons that I applied to boxing, but to the rest of my life. And I'm going to break down the three most valuable lessons I learned for you today so that you may take them and get them uh, the easy way and not have to get knocked out on international television to get the same lessons. So the first lesson is perspective. Life is not uh, so much what happens to us, it's how we see it, because how we see it decides how we react to it, and it's our reactions that determine the quality of our life. I remember the morning after the fight. I didn't want to check my phone. I didn't want to be involved in any social media. I wanted the outside world to disappear. I was hurting because it was now the adrenaline's worn off. I'm like, man, I really did get hit. Uh, to say I was depressed is probably too strong, but I definitely was feeling really bad about myself and was caught up in just my own self-pity. But you know what doesn't care about self-pity? Hunger. I need to eat breakfast. You know what else doesn't care? <laughs> the hotel staff. They were, you know, checkout was at 11, man. We had to get some food and, and get out of there. So, so I wandered down to the, to the lobby uh, where the other fighters were eating breakfast. And I don't remember what I got that morning. Probably something basic like eggs, bacon, and one of those little, uh, I love these things, man. The batter comes out, and you put it in the, the waffle maker and flip the waffle, and it's delicious, man. Uh, but I didn't want to be bothered with anybody, so I sat in the corner by myself and just started eating. But I didn't want to check my phone either because that's what I, I normally would do. I really didn't want to see uh, anything about the fight because the internet is forever, but more importantly, the internet is fast. I was probably at least 100 memes at this point. So I did something that I never do and I don't recommend any of you ever do. I started watching the news. The news was on in the uh, cafeteria. And I hate the news. I think it just is very negative, and that negativity you put in your mind is going to affect how you see the day. And I'm just not, not a fan of it. So, so I started watching the news. And the very first thing I seen was a story about the bombings in Aleppo, Syria. And I had no idea about that situation. I don't consider myself an ignorant person. Uh, on most things, but I, I am somewhat willfully ignorant of international politics and domestic politics as well. But I learned about the bombing in Aleppo, Syria, and the people that were affected and the lives that were being changed and the children that were being driven away and how the whole city just looked like, looked like something out of Fallout 3. And I was like, man, that's crazy. And really, I mean, it got me. The next piece of news to uplift my mood, you know, followed was about a police shooting that just occurred in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
to which they were using <laughs> to contrast another police shooting that just happened down the road in Tulsa about a week earlier from where we were at. I was like, oh man, the police is still shooting people. That's, that's sad too. And then the last thing that I remember seeing on the news that morning, turns out the night before, that fight was on a, on a, uh, a Friday night and then it was Saturday morning. It turns out that Friday before, some psycho walked into a mall in Washington State, shot five people dead, one of which was a 16-year-old cancer survivor. And then it hit me. It got super clear to me all of a sudden. I had just lost the fight and it really sucked for me. I was embarrassed, broke, <laughs> but I could go home to my family. I could go home to the people that cared about me. I could continue trying to do something with my life. On the other hand, these people that were just on the news, uh, many of them were losing life and liberty for no other reason than they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember back to 2012, we were getting ready for the Olympic trials here in America, and the group I was training with out in California, they got UFC legend and action film star Randy Couture to come out and talk to us. I got cool pictures with the guy, man. He's got me in a headlock. It's one of my coolest, one of my most favorite pictures, right? And we're asking him about his life in the octagon and the movies he's made and some of his successes and some of his failures. And on his failures, he said something that stuck with me that I've shared with other guys who have lost or gone through hard times, and I'm going to share with you today. He said that if the worst thing that happens to you in your life is that you lose a fight, then your life is going all right. And that, that, that stuck with me. Now, I'm assuming most of you are not professional fighters. I'm assuming most of you aren't even amateur fighters. And I really hope none of you are weakened warriors who decide to have a few drinks at the local watering hole and then start throwing punches. So you wanna port this to your own life. You're a student or a business owner or an employee, and you know, if the worst thing that happens to you in your life is that you lose a little money, you're doing all right. The worst thing that happens to you in your life is that you fail an exam, you're doing all right. The worst thing that happens to you in your life is that you don't get some promotion you were gunning for, you're doing all right. Now it's natural and expected to be frustrated when these things happen, but to stay focused on them at the expense of the bigger picture where you lose sight of what really matters is a travesty. And what is important? What really matters? And that brings me to my second lesson. I'm of the opinion that other people are the most important thing in life. No matter how technologically advanced or automated the world becomes, we're still gonna get most of our drive and motivation from our interactions with other people. By extension, this means the support you receive in your most dire times of need is going to be directly proportional to the goodwill you propagate when you're in a position to do so, when you are climbing up the mountain, when you are at the top of the mountain. Man, I'll tell you what, the, the thing that I was afraid of uh, getting on social media, I was afraid <laughs> that, I, that, that people, man, they were, they were going to just be eviscerating me and, and just me, you know, the internet's just not a nice place. <laughs> But, but, you know, aside from one guy telling me that I needed to update my profile to accurately reflect my new record, and he did this about an hour after the fight, you know, forget letting me lick my wounds in peace, and maybe, maybe five or so random trolls throughout the year. I've received nothing but support and encouragement from my friends, family, and fans, you know. How you treat people going up is how they're going to treat you when you're coming down. What you put out into the world is exactly what you're going to get back. We call this karma. And you're going to experience this karma when you least expect it. Now, if you've got good karma, you're going to receive support. You're going to receive encouragement. You're going to receive nothing but love from the people who want to see you do nothing more than either get back on the mountain you fell off of or get back on another mountain. But if you get bad karma, you're gonna get salt thrown in your wounds. You're gonna get kicked while you're down. 
you're going to get nothing but constant reminders that when it was easiest for you to be a good and generous person, you chose to do the exact opposite. And they're going to remind you and do nothing. <laughs> they, they, they're going to see you fail, not for the sake of failure, but so you can relive your embarrassment over and over and over again. And, and, and in an interesting way, that brings me to my third and final lesson. While I believe that other people are the most important thing for helping to cushion your fall off the mountain, it is your willingness to face your fears and get over your embarrassment that's going to determine whether you ever get back on the mountain again or not. You know, when you're, when you're climbing the mountain and when you're at the top of the mountain, you're not thinking about what it's like to be embarrassed. You're not thinking about fear. You would be highly ineffective if before every time you reached out and made a move, you thought about how it was gonna go wrong. You thought about how you were gonna to fall to the bottom. But now that you have fallen to the bottom, you get to viscerally know something you've only intellectually thought about in passing. You get to know what it's like to really be embarrassed, to really feel fear. You know, I didn't, I didn't watch my fight for 10 months. It took, it took 10 months. And normally when you fight, you're supposed to go back and see what you've done. <laughs> I didn't do that. It took 10 months because I, I, I couldn't watch myself get hurt, you know. That's 10 months where I didn't improve. That's 10 months where I didn't learn. That's 10 months where I wasn't sure if I just made a mistake or if it was time to hang the gloves up. And then one day, I, I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. There's never going to be a right time to watch this. Let's just watch it. So I remember it was like July, and I watched it. And you know what my first thought was when I watched it? I'm losing hair, man. I got to start shaving my head. <laughs> I'm serious. I was like, look, I was like, man, that, that is horrible looking. I wasn't even worried about getting hit at that point. I was like, okay, now you see I'm, I don't have any hair. It's shaved off. But... <laughs> Because uh, embarrassment is a funny thing. Unlike the other emotions, uh, there's no real counter to it. You know, when you are sad, you can think happy thoughts and cheer yourself up. When you're angry, you can focus on something that makes you happy and calm you down. But, but when you're embarrassed, even if you own the thing that made you feel like trash, it is just not going to work. And sometimes you need to take time off when you fall, when you're hurt, when you're traumatized, so that you can heal and come back better. But you gotta be careful because you become what you do repeatedly. If you get into the habit of charging for right after a fall, sure, you'll be courageous and you'll be strong and you will never doubt yourself. Oh, well, strong in, in here, you probably may have a limp or something hurting. But, uh, the point is that you will never doubt what you can do, even if you're not optimal to do it. But if you get into the habit of always retreating, always pulling back, always pulling back, you know, you know it's not quite ready, it is not, I need more time, you're gonna become used to doing that. You're gonna become a person who's used to giving into your fear. And that fear is gonna own you. I used to have a lot of fears in boxing. But the, I guess the biggest fear was losing, right? Losing by knockout was probably a little bigger than that. And I guess even bigger than that was losing by knockout in front of everyone I knew. And what was I afraid of? It's gonna sound crazy, man. Because I started boxing so, so old. I was, I was afraid that my girlfriend wouldn't like me anymore. I was afraid my friends wouldn't think I was cool. And I'm not talking about friends that just showed up uh, when I started boxing. I mean, these are guys that I've known longer than I haven't. I was afraid my family wouldn't talk to me anymore. I guess that's not really that bad of a thing. Uh, my coach would disown me. And the boxing gods would come down from the top of Mount Pugilism and they would revoke my boxing credentials because I had been proven to be a fraud. Well, got knocked out in front of everybody I know. Girlfriend's still here in the back taking pictures. Friends are probably asleep, but they still talk to me. 
Coach is happy I'm back in the gym. Family is still annoyed when I talk to him. And I still have my boxing skills. None of this changed, you know, and I, I had this fear because I began to identify myself solely as a boxer rather than as a person who boxed. And we do this all the time on other things. We stop seeing ourselves as a person engaged in a task and we start to see ourselves as the task devoid of any other human characteristics or traits. When you're climbing a mountain, this is a very useful quality. But when you fall, it can be downright devastating because now the thing that you made, your identity, is gone. You're not there anymore. You're not on the mountain. And the only remedy to this, you have to remember, just as I had to remember. I'm not the mountain. I am a mountain climber. And you are too. You know? So... To all you mountain climbers out there, I wish you the best in your climb, and I hope you never need any of this advice, but if you should you, if you do need it, you know, it's here. If you're at the top of the mountain, I wish you a long and prosperous reign, and I hope you never need any of this advice. And if you've fallen off the mountain, and you're sitting there, and you're embarrassed, you're afraid of what's gonna happen, if you get back on the mountain, just remember something, you are not the mountain. You are a mountain climber. And you falling off the mountain was probably the best thing to ever happen to you in one way or the other. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, man. How about this guy? So the way that we are going to do questions is there's actually a microphone right there in the back. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier on our production crew. Uh, but if you have questions um, during or for any of our speakers, it'd be fantastic if we could line you up in the back. Um, since I didn't give anyone fair warning, and you might be taking a second to get up or, or putting your questions together, um, I wanted to, first of all, just thank Ed again for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> And do some really quick housekeeping. Um, everyone should have the orange bands on your arm and been informed that you're going to get a free entree from Chula right across the street for lunch. That's between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. So if you're going to sneak out early or hang around, um, that is the window at which that's going to work. Anyone got any questions? Did I psych everyone out with the thing I said at the beginning? Cool. Um, in that case, Ed is going to be, yes. Hello. He's speaking in the mic, if possible. We just, we teach, and we didn't know if you come to schools as a motivational speaker. Oh, no, I, I can't hate oh, schools. You, no? No. <laughs> no, no, uh, sure. Well, our, our <laughs> I don't know if, if you've been keeping up with any of the news head stories. Um, recently, a district next to us um, made the news yesterday with terroristic threats. With what? With terroristic threats. Oh, no. Of a student coming to school with multiple weapons, um, a 14 year old. Wow. Uh, so I just. It's just really, we fear every day for safety as a teacher and just to hit the youth. Uh, you know, hitting adults is great too, um, but to hit the youth is just, everything that you say, you know, it just, if the kids could just get speakers like this, it'd be great because they just, they don't, they don't get anything. I would love they to. Don't. So. They, they, I mean, they're just, they're troubled. They're, um, and we're expected to meet the expectations of the state to such a level that is um, beyond our control due to, you know, what some of our student population deals with and struggles mm -hmm. with. 
And with uh, this neighboring district, actually two neighboring districts, um, having this, one district's not having school on Monday oh. due to this. Um, and it actually made national news too last night. So not only was it on, you know, um, KDK and WTAE last night, it also made national news. Uh, so it's scary. So like for us to go to work on Monday, what do, what do we expect? And, and he, the kid, I don't know if you watched the news, made the comment that it's very easy to take a gun to school. Oh, so, it, so this, I don't know if people realize the safety issues and the concerns and the, the things that our youth are dealing with that, um, you know, it's brought to school. It's brought to school every day. But I don't know. <laughs> it's just what, what, what we deal with. So just trying to look at the positives and trying to get the kids to realize, you know, you're going to face defeat. And, and, but to be positive, they, they don't have any of that. <laughs> in the 60 minutes that I have them in, which is 4% of their day. So I have to make that, those things happen in 4% of their day. To make, <laughs> to make people see things in a good way in a small amount of time. Uh -huh. the, and teach them the state <clears throat> standards and make them pass a state test too. Um, and then if I don't, I'm, I'm a bad <laughs> teacher, so. <laughs> I, think, I think the best way to get a person to see the positive of, of a situation is to put them into, and but but not too much, just a little over their head, and let them survive the task. Because in, in a small amount, like and by survive, I mean like a maybe a slightly harder math problem, right? Just as an example, not not a crazy one, but just a little thing that that forces a kid to feel confident in themselves because you, you change their relationship with themselves and you'll change the relationship with the world. But I, I feel like, I feel like, and this is just a feeling, that this day and age is, is very, it's not very challenging. Everything is very uh, the, the instant. There, there are no difficulties. Even a, even a uh, low class life where I, where I, how I grew up, you know, it, I think someone growing up the way I grew up now with everything we have in the world, it won't be that difficult. And so you never learn what you're capable of doing. And the moment you encounter some difficulty, there is simply no uh, mature response that's been developed. And I think you can develop that response in, in other areas. If a person is confident that, okay, I got past this exam, a little studying and a little focusing, Maybe when uh, when someone comes and decides to take something, or they lose something, or their, their home life gets a little difficult. Maybe, just maybe. I think, I think we do that as teachers every day. We try to instill that, but to have an outside, you know, person or a speaker to come in and and just deliver that message is a whole other ball game. Because a lot of the times we don't we don't have that. Yeah. Um, we don't. There's not a lot of speakers. We. What did we have this year? We. We've had one. One coming up. Um, to to speak. So, um, but it's still not enough. It's just not enough. So to hear it from the outside source, we could say it to you know and help the kids as much as possible. But in the end, we're the people that's there every day. So when it comes from someone else, it's just a little bit different. But, um, thank you. Thank you. I, stro I strongly recommend bringing in Ed. Strongly recommend bringing in Ed. Barcia. So does Ed. Time for one more? One more question. Okay. At 23, you said you started the boxing. Yeah. What happened at that time that made you want to go into it? <laughs> and did you know at that age that it was going to be a late game to start? Um, okay, so the first question, I love this story. I'm going to give you the abridged version for the sake of time. I started boxing at 23 because I had for all intents and purposes, wasted my life from 18 to 22, you know. And I, I say, I start with 18 because that's when you're an adult and you're kind of expected to have some kind of direction. Though it's probably a little early, that's the expectation, and I certainly failed to meet it. Some things changed in my life. Particularly, I mean, I got booted out of, relation, of the relationship I was in. And, and forget dumped. I mean, booted is definitely a better way to... to uh, explain what happened. So I said, okay, I have no time equity in anything. I have nothing to show 
for these past four years. Let me start putting Tom Equity into something. And I'd always wanted to punch people in the face. So I said, this is cool. You know, let me do this and see how far this will go. So that's how I ended up boxing. Is it was just a place where I could put some time equity. And now I like all the other things that have come with it, but if I'm being 100% honest with you, I didn't originally get into the sport for discipline. I didn't get into the sport to be in shape. I kept myself in okay shape. Uh, and I didn't get into it thinking there would be, ever be any money. I got into it because I wanted to put time equity somewhere, right? Um, the other part of your question was, did I, did I have any expectation? Uh, my only expectation was that I, I didn't, I'll, even, I'll scratch the word expectation. The only standard that I applied to myself for boxing was that I, wasn't, I was, that I was going to get beat out of the gym. In other words, I wasn't going to quit. I was going to get hurt so badly or get beat up so badly or just have zero talent for this thing that it was like, okay, you got to leave. Like, like, I've seen coaches tell guys, look, man, this probably ain't for you. Like, and I really don't want to see you get hurt. Uh, and that's pretty much, I was like, okay, they're going to have to have that conversation with me. Fortunately, no one has <laughs> had that conversation with me because there's just through a combination of, of many factors. Uh, I've, I've had a really good, the sport has been good to me at all levels. And, and I would say at the very least, I've had an above average time of boxing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give it up for Ed one more time. Ed, Ed is going to be available right out in the lobby if you want to continue the conversation, have questions that didn't get answered. We've also got a few copies of his book to give away as well. Uh, so definitely make sure you check that it's out. It's a giveaway. It's a giveaway. Can't beat free. Thank you. <laughs>